Brightspace is down is problematic because one of the main things I wanted to do today was show you where all the study stuff I put on WebAssign is and is going to go. And I'm just going to have to describe it to you the old fashioned way instead. Um, before I get started with all of the study prep information, any uh, questions, needs, concerns from you guys? Do we have one more day next Monday? No, because there's a test coming up. Uh, what about what yesterday tomorrow went down? Um, the key was in there to check if I got it. Correct. That's because it was a new practice test and need to make a new key. Okay. So a key is coming. I'll further describe that in a second. Thank you for asking. Please work. Okay. So Brightspace is down, but I did upload a practice test to it. Um, and I think I started out of my usual order. Let me rewind. Test is next week. As a reminder, it is happening during lab time. It'll be on the first four chapters, which is everything we've covered so far. Uh, to help you study for the test, I have uploaded to the website that you can't currently get to a practice test and a list of all of the concepts that we've covered so far. Uh, the way that that will work is, when you can eventually get access to Brightspace, uh, there's a tab labeled Test 1. It's under the Chapter 4 tab. If you click on that tab, the first thing you'll see is the list of concepts that we've talked about up until now. The purpose of this list is for you to look at it and make sure that everything on it makes sense and it's something that you can verbally explain to yourself what it is, what we've done with it, what information you need, what problems about it. Uh, since that list is currently not visible, I have partially replicated it here on the board just to give everyone an idea of what things you need to be familiar with by next week. Chapter 1 and 2 was partially review and partially about our first three vectors. Uh, in the review section of Chapter 1, we talked about the metric system, unit conservation. We also went over some of the algebra and trigonometry that we're going to be using all semester. Make sure you know how to do those. Then we moved on to discussing the differences between vectors and scalars, and we talked about our first three vectors, displacement, velocity, and acceleration. And there, additionally, the first four formulas that relate those three things to one another. Fantastic Four, it's on the top of your formula sheet. Make sure you have a copy of this. Uh, chapter 3, we then moved on to looking at two-dimensional vectors, mostly the same three vectors, just in two dimensions instead of one. Uh, those tend to point in weird directions, and we tend to turn them into triangles, to specifically right triangles, to break them down into their xy components. You can add any two vectors together as long as they're vectors of the same variable. You can add two velocity vectors together, but you cannot add a velocity vector to a displacement vector. And you need to make sure to add the x components to the x components and the y components to the y components. This is also when we discussed projectile motion, since most things, since projectiles can fall down and move side to side simultaneously. The term projectile motion refers to the entire genre of questions that includes object being launched at an angle off of a cliff, or off of a building, or thrown horizontally. That entire genre of questions is projectile motion. 
Chapter 4 is what we've been doing for the past two weeks. We started with Newton's laws and how they relate to the concept of force. You do have to know what those three laws are in order. Law 1 is the law of inertia. Law 2 is F equals MA. And law 3 is uh, the action-reaction force law. We then started talking about different types of forces, where they come from, what they do, how they work together with other forms of force. Uh, gravity, make sure you can calculate the weight of an object. Friction, well, I'm out of order. Normal force, that's the force a surface creates, specifically perpendicular to its own surface. That's part of the definition. Friction, force created when two surfaces slide across one another. And tension. Lost my train of thought again. Tension is the force a rope exerts inward on both sides. Get familiar with those four types of force and rest comfortably in the fact that all forms of force can be added together normally since they're all forces and they're all measured in newtons. Last article here just says pulleys and ramps, just as variables that can add extra layers to a question. Pulleys just change the direction of a rope, change the direction of tension. That's all they're there for. When I say ramps, the main thing that's referring to is the idea that on an incline, normal force points in a weird angle, and it is no longer equal and opposite to gravity. This causes objects to slide down ramps. This also affects friction, since friction depends on normal force. The main thing you'll need to remember about that is this triangle, the one I draw every time we do a ramp question, because it summarizes the relationship between gravity, which always points down, the new angle of normal force, and their vector sum that drags you down the ramp. You may doodle this in the margins of your formula sheet. You will need access to this triangle at least once on the test. Spoiler alert. That is all of the things that will be on the test. Best ways to study for the test include going over this list, making sure everything sounds familiar and that you feel comfortable utilizing all of these principles, looking over the formula sheet, making sure that, let me actually, trying to just figure out what sections on this thing you need. I think it's just the second law. Only things you'll need off of the formula sheet for the time being are the Fantastic Four, Newton's second law, and the friction equation. Yes? Yes. If you don't run off your own copy, copies will be available during the test. You, you will have a formula sheet. It just benefits you if you have your own. We can write one yes. on our own. Okay. You can write on it. You can label things in terms of how your brain uh, best remembers them. You can write down Sokotoa, King Henry Die by that triangle. You just, if you can somehow predict the future, you just can't write down the test answers. Also, if you can predict the future, see me after class. Yes? Can we write down the different iterations of all the different formulas on there, like, for, so we don't have to like rewrite them like that? Yes. So, um, whenever Brightspace starts working, hopeful reload. It's not yet. Nope. Thank you. Um, this list will be there. Maybe a slightly longer version. This is just the one I did from my memory. Uh, additionally, within the test one tab is this practice test. Uh, the practice test itself, as a general rule, I always make the practice tests longer and more difficult than the test proper, because I'd rather you make mistakes here than there. Uh, the actual test is eight questions, both a mix of concept questions and Work, word problem math questions. The practice test, I wrote it out of order for some reason. The last page 
is various concept questions. And then in addition, there is nine math word problems at the front of the document. The test will be formatted fairly similarly. However, the first page of the test will ask for your name, sign for the honor statement, honor code, and then have brief explanation of any rules and facts that you will need to be able to do the test. But the formatting will be pretty similar. Just pages of word problems with space to work them out. Additionally, um, I do include a little line that I'd like you to write your answers on, just because it makes it easier for me to find them quickly. It's not a requirement, it's just a favor to me. Um, as I said, I wrote this practice test specifically after I wrote the test itself to make sure that it utilized the same principles and it involved similar types of questions. So if you want practice to make sure you're ready for the test, this is the best thing to access and to start working on. As Brightspace isn't working at the moment, if you want to access this sooner rather than later, frankly, I will probably just send out no, I don't have Brightspace to do that for me. If you email me, I will send you this file if you want to access it sooner rather than later. Whenever Brightspace does start working, it will be there, and I will also be uploading an answer key so that you can check your work. Uh, that answer key will have my work in it. It's not just going to be the answers, so you'll be able to actually see how I recommend doing things, and so that you can check things over, fix things, without having to email me. Like you can email me at any point, but it will get the feedback quicker. <coughs> yes? Does the web assign homeworks and quizzes give us uh, the right answers for the ones that we have on? Do you know that? Wait, say again? Like on the web assign homeworks and quizzes, it just gives us the next whenever we don't get it right. Do they give it, are, you, is, are we able to see like the answer key for those so we can work them? That would be a good idea. Yeah, I can do that. Is it quite possible on your end? Okay. Yes, yes it is. And tragically, I don't know if it's a problem necessarily with the school's Wi-Fi. It might just be that some server that a bunch of websites use is down, like whatever hosting service a bunch of websites happen to use. I'm not sure. School seems to think it's their fault, so I'll blame them. Um, the web assign isn't working either. But once this issue's fixed, I will change that. Thank you for that idea. Hope we'll reload. Nope. What was my next point? Oh. Studying this, definitely the best thing you can do. Next best thing would be going over old homeworks, labs, quizzes, etc. And on all of those things, tell me if you have questions. Now, this is optional. It's ungraded, it's just practice. You don't have to ever look at it if you feel completely comfortable, but most of my students ask for practice, so here it is. Um, test is designed to take an hour. Since we're doing it during lab, you will have longer than an hour to take it if you want to. The whole purpose of doing it during lab time is so that you don't have to rush in, take it in 50 minutes, and rush out. You can come in, work at your own pace. You can go longer than an hour if you need to, or if you like, you also then have the time for accommodations as well. Um, so don't rush. You're going to do fine on it. You'll have your calculator. You'll have your formula sheet. You'll have a teacher at the front of the room to, to help make sure you understand all the questions. and. There's bonus points built in. There's 105 points of question on the test. Each question says how many points it's worth. If you total up all those points, it adds up to 105, and I grade it out of 100. There's not technically a bonus question. There's just bonus points built in. So if you do really well and give an honest attempt at every question, you can get over 100 that way. I just, I don't like arbitrarily deciding which one's worth the bonus points, so this system just kind of puts it on you for whichever one you go above and beyond on. Um, do you do like errors carry forward and all that stuff? Like have points here and there and then 
in case like if we get one part of a vector wrong and then we use it for the next part, so we do like an error straight forward. I've not heard that term before. So my if I, if my face looks confused, I just haven't you heard that description of that. And to make sure I don't respond wrong, I'm just going to say what I do rather than answering yes or no. If you make a mistake and like calculate time wrong, and then you use that wrong time in a later part of the question, and then that makes the next part wrong, I don't count off for that. If you made an honest mistake finding time, like you pressed the wrong button or you didn't write down a minus sign and that affected the time answer, I would take off a point or two for that, for that mistake, but it won't affect you moving forwards because the next part couldn't have been right if your time was wrong. Did I answer the question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Error, what was, what was the phrase you used? Error carried forward for a mistake carried forward. Okay, and? I, I mean, I've, wait, I've heard it plenty of times, so. Okay. And I know like some other people use it. Error, so you make an error. How would I respond to that? Would, it, would I say that I do grade for errors carried forward, or I don't grade for errors carried forward? If you do grade for errors carried forward, that means the mistakes will compound. Will, yeah, but if you don't, then it'll do exactly what. Right. Okay, so I don't grade for errors carried forward. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Questions about the test for right now? Okay. You guys are gonna do fine. I know physics is scary, I know tests are scary, but you'll have everything you need to be able to do your honest best on this, and I honestly do have faith in all of you guys. You're doing fine on everything up till now. This is just the first speed bump. Yes? How is the test compared to the homework questions? Hmm. I would say I attempt to write the homework questions to be friendlier than the web assigned ones. Like obviously, they're still physics questions. But I try to make sure you have all the information needed to understand what's being asked and you to find the answer. Honestly, if you want to see what they look like, the practice test is a good place to look. I wrote the test, I wrote these. And again, these are harder than the test ones, or at the very least, there's more of them. An example, I would say, of this version being harder than the test itself. Let's scroll down to the concept questions. Uh, you will need to know Newton's laws for the test. They're important, we're gonna use them all year. So as a result, I have asked for Newton's laws. Now, on the practice test, I've just asked, what are they? You, I assume that you would check your notes or you'd check Wikipedia, you'd note them, you'd maybe copy them down onto this page if you were doing it by hand. On the actual test, there's going to be five pre-written statements and you'll have to pick which three are laws of motion and you will have to number them. The point isn't for you to have memorized them verbatim, the point is that you know what they are and can recognize them. Now, I've rewritten them, so it's not the exact wording you might have seen before. The goal is for you to be able to understand what they mean by reading them and then identify them. And since there's only, again, three laws of motion, there's two dummy statements that may or may not be true at all that you'll have to navigate around. So, of the five statements, number one, two, three for the laws of motion, and leave the dummy statements blank. If you take physics 1510 with me, I do something similar for the laws of thermodynamics. eight questions, 105 points total. That's the only one that's really multiple choice. Um, they are mostly math questions, I will admit. But that means that of the eight questions, if like two or three are 
uh, word problems, and there's only five algebra, fully algebra questions. So still less than this, and less than homework, actually. Do you have anything on there that we have to create like for free body diagrams or images that we draw? Yes. <coughs> yeah, I imagine like that's all the like I did find all the vectors where they go. Correct. If, if the question is grading you for a free body diagram, it will say so. Okay. Like if you were asked for one, that is the point of the question. If it doesn't specifically ask for one, then you don't have to like fully draw one out because you don't need one for the way your process <coughs> works. But there is at least one that will ask for one. Okay. Similarly, where is it? There's one here too. So if you're doing this, practicing along with the study guide, I will have a demonstration of what a free body diagram for a ramp would look like in the key. Yes? Uh, if you have questions about it, mm -hmm. um, would email, uh, sending an email be better, or asking now about it, or? Email, anytime is good, now is good, Friday is good in class. My plan for the rest of today and Friday is open up the floor to questions for you guys, and if at any point you don't have any, I'm gonna start introducing concepts, like prologue stuff for chapter five. Next week. Today and this Friday, if you don't have questions, I'm gonna introduce concepts for chapter five. Nothing too serious. I don't want to like confuse you with new formulas or anything. Just prologue stuff. But that's that should be motivation for you. Start studying. Come with questions. Make sure that the stuff we talk about is as relevant to what you need as possible. Cool. Okay. So. Again, if you want, if you don't have, if you didn't download the practice test yet, I put it up yesterday, if you didn't access it before Brightspace decided to crash, uh, I can email me and I'll send the file to you. Uh, and I'll, the same people who asked, I'll send the answer to you. I'll fill that today as well. Uh, as I said, we'll open the floor up now to questions. And when you don't have questions, I will talk a little bit about energy before we break for the day. Yeah. Magnitude refers to the number. So, let's see. Where you say asking about? Which one are you ask? Which one are you looking at? Sorry. Oh no. Like, oh, just in general. Yes. Okay. So, good question. Magnitude is just a fancy way of asking for the number of the vector. Like, how big is the vector? So. What is the magnitude of the net force pointing on this object from this, from you? What is the magnitude of this net force? What is the number for it? Now all vectors are made up of magnitude and direction. Magnitude is the size of the vector, direction is where it points. So if I ever ask you for magnitude, that is, what is the number of the answer? also be a good practice for a free body diagram. So why are all my markers hidden from me? Who does this? Alright, so number four describes a sled being dragged across the ground. So I will draw our sled. Behold a sled. Mass of 50 kilograms. Uh, it is being pulled with a constant force of 100 newtons. It's just being dragged across a snowy field. 
The, I would say the wrinkle to this one, the one that makes this one weird, is the 100 Newton force is not pointing horizontally. Now, if you were dragging a sled behind you on a snow day, I don't see this very much outside of like old Hallmark movies or old Peanuts films, but at least stereotypically, if you had a sled and you were a kid dragging it around on a winter day, you probably had it connected to a rope and you were just walking forward as it slid across the ground behind you. When you do that, the rope is not pointing horizontally, the rope is angled downwards. This is true of anything that you drag by a rope, like the hand, well not even a rope, the handle of a wagon, anything like that really. As a result, the force is not pointing horizontally, the force is pointing at the same angle as the rope. This does affect a few things. That is the force that you, the sled owner, are applying to this object. And the sled is being dragged at constant velocity. The sled is being dragged at constant velocity. If we're exerting a force forwards on the sled, and yet it isn't accelerating, it's moving at constant velocity, therefore it is not accelerating, that means there has to be some force working against us to counteract the force we are pulling forwards. The only way for the sled to move at constant velocity is for all the forces on it to add up to zero. Constant velocity and also motionless all mean balanced forces. And so, even being dragged on snow, there is a force of friction uh, attempting to slow the sled down. There's at least two more forces present here to acknowledge. One, we can assume this takes place on Earth, so there is a force of gravity. And two, since we're moving across flat ground, the ground is supporting the sled's weight. We are not falling straight down, so the ground is exerting normal force upwards. Yes? Can you draw the, in your diagram, the normal force and the force of gravity backwards or the opposite arrows? Wait, like... Like normal force upwards down here? Yes. Yeah, that's fine, as long as they're labeled. Is tension not a force acting on the slope? It is. Um, I call it tension? Technically, there's tension in the rope. So if you wanted to give a name to this 100 Newtons, you could call it tension, you could call it the force that the human is applying, those are all good names for it. But the main thing is that there's 100 newtons being applied at 45 degrees. The, the name is not, for that one, is not very, is super important. But it is technically a tension. That's a good observation. And you know what? I'll even, I'm going to label it tension because I'm glad you pointed that out. It needs a label. So, those are all of the forces present. To go through the questions in order, one, I already spoiled this one a little bit, what is the net force acting on this sled? Zero, it is moving at constant velocity, therefore it is not accelerating, therefore if acceleration is zero, net force is zero. That will be very helpful. B, what are all the forces acting on the sled? We've already identified them. I went out of order. C, what is the magnitude of all of these forces? 
here's where things start to get, begin getting a little bit tricky because of the wrinkle that the 45 degrees adds. Out of all the forces we've identified, of the three that we don't have numbers for yet, which of those three is going to be the easiest to find a number for? Gravity. We can do the same thing for that we always do. Force of gravity is m times g. We know the sled's mass. We know g on planet Earth. So that force of gravity should be 480 newtons downward. Wait, did I get that? Four knot? I got four knot. Thank you, sorry. So that is how much the sled weighs. Yes? Just one question real quick about the net force. Mm -hmm. So be, it's zero, is it, a, because it doesn't have the acceleration, the net force is zero. I mean, you know, it doesn't have the acceleration because it didn't give us the acceleration. Because it is moving at constant velocity. So, we have the sled's weight. This will help us fill in all the rest of the blanks. I'm now going to do net force analysis on both the x and y axis to kind of show how all these present forces relate to one another. In the y axis, as per usual, we have normal force pointing up, gravity pointing down, but is there another vertical force present in this situation? Is friction vertical? Oh, sorry, tension. That was probably my ears acting up, I apologize. Yes, tension, the force we are applying, has a vertical component because of the angle it is being applied at. So the Y component of tension is a factor here. This means that this is going to be one of those situations where gravity and tension aren't equal. They will be opposite. They still point up and down, but they're not equal this time. So this is kind of like a scenario where if you're standing on a bathroom scale and you like use a counter to push upwards slightly, the scale is going to read less because it doesn't have to exert as much force to hold you up. So since we're pulling up on the sled, the ground doesn't have to work as hard. Normal force is going to be less as a result. So that means before we find a number for normal force, we have to divvy up tension into its legs first. Now the neat thing about 45 degree angles is those two legs will be the same number, just by a quirk of the math. But I will show the steps either way. If we do, so Emma, sine of 45 is gonna be the Y leg over 100. And cosine, X leg over 100. I believe that means both legs should come to about 70 newtons. Thank. Yes. And you can do both versions just to double check. Because of the 45 degrees, they just happen to be the same number. It is coincidence. They are still separate vectors. Separate legs, excuse me. Now that we have a value for Ty, we can figure out what Fn is. using our y-force analysis. Normal force minus the value of gravity plus that extra piece. Notice again, that tension points upwards. So in terms of net force on the sled, 
it's going to reduce the amount of normal force we need to exert. Send these two over to the other side. Answer should be something to the effect of 420. <laughs> Thank you. Also, Gazunzai to whoever sneezed. So that is the required normal force from the ground at the moment. Note again, if this Y leg wasn't there, tension would be, sorry, not tension, normal force would be equal and opposite to gravity. So this is one of those weird exceptions. Tension and normal force, I keep saying the wrong force. Normal force and gravity are equal and opposite when the ground is level and when there's no other vertical forces interfering. Here, there's another vertical force interfering. So if it wasn't being pulled, it'd be equal. Yes. Or if the rope was pointing straight horizontal. This is why when we did the friction lab the other week, I made sure to point out to hold the rope and the force gauge or as per parallel to the board instead of like this. I don't understand how, since we have normal force left, oh, because we don't need to do other side. Yes, add 490 to the other side, minus 70.7 to the other side. But what about the, um, what about the force that you So, this was my starting point. We know that net force equals zero. Specifically in the y-axis, net force is still zero, and net force is also equal to all the forces that add together to make it. So all three of these things are the same, and I just carry through from this point to find net force. Whenever you have like three things that are equal to one another, you can elect to ignore one of those sides and just work with one equal side. Yes? So, I assume that because it's horizontal, that the force of gravity would be equal and opposite to the normal like force. Why is that not true? Is it because it's moving? Not necessarily because it's moving. It's because there's an extra force present in the y-axis. If, if instead of the rope pointing up here, like if, if somehow the rope was being held parallel to the ground, there would be no other y-force present and normal force and gravity would be equal and opposite as normal. But because of the angle of the rope, that introduces this y-component to that tension. And as a result, you kind of end up lifting the sled off of the ground more than it otherwise would be. Um, I suppose if you were physically watching a child do this, it would probably result in the sled physically tilting and just skirting on the back end of itself. And as a result, there's physically less of itself pressing into the, dirt, into the ground. As a result, the ground doesn't need to exert as much normal force to hold it up. Again, it's like the scenario where if you're standing on a bathroom scale and you lean against the counter to like pick yourself up slightly, the scale no longer reads as much weight because it's not measuring weight, it's measuring the normal force it needs to hold you up. That's all it knows. And so by lifting yourself up on the edge of the counter, it reads less because it doesn't need to use as much normal force. You've introduced another vertical force into the equilibrium. So the, the, the rule is gravity and normal force are equal and opposite on flat level ground where you're not accelerating up or down and where they are the only two vertical forces present. If you're tilted or if there's an extra vertical force or if you're accelerating up and down, that rule doesn't apply. So there's a lot of exceptions. So it's kind of weird that that's still like the most common thing because we live on flat ground most of the time. Does this feel all right now? Does it not feel all right? Let me ask that. Okay. There's 
okay if it resumes feeling not all right later. Um, still got to find force of friction. That one's going to be a little easier. We're going to continue assuming net force equals zero, but looking at the x-axis instead. The x-axis forces on the sled are tensions x component forward and the force of friction backward. There's only two this time. They have to be equal and opposite. As long as they add up to zero. And the force of gravity or the force is a barrier that affects the y axis component. Yes. Uh, normal force and gravity are interacting with the y component of tension. Is that what you asked? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we know what that x component of tension is. And technically, the force of friction points. Oh, that's fine. So this will confirm the force of friction is negative 7.7 .7 because it points away from the force forwards. And it happens to be equal and opposite because we're moving at constant velocity. This is, this is similar to the cruise control situation. Got your car's cruise control on, the force the engine exerts forward is equal and opposite to the force of friction backwards to create equilibrium and to keep your car at the same speed. But it's also true if you're just walking at constant speed, too. And that is actually a number for every force present. So that's part C done. Lastly, part D is what is the value of kinetic friction? We're sliding, so the friction present must be kinetic, even on slick snow and ice. There is still some friction. So the force of friction we just found is that the static friction? No, the force of friction that we found is kinetic. Okay. Because of all the data we've been given so far is for sliding forwards at constant velocity. So all of this data involves motion. Since motion is involved, it has to be kinetic friction. <coughs> Bless you. So if we want kinetic mu, we will use the force of kinetic friction, which is the one we already found. And thankfully, we already found a value for our weird adjusted normal force. So absolute values. 70.7 .7 equals 419.3 times mu k. Mu k should come out to be 0 0.07 approximately, I think. Very small amount of friction, which makes sense for planter. So the mu is the coefficient? Yes, okay. sorry. Coefficient of friction is. Did you say 0.17? Sorry, I think 0 0.07? No, it's 0 0.17. Oh, okay. I'm bad at mental math. I didn't have that one prepped. 0.17? I'm just going to get my calculator out because I keep saying the wrong number. Part of that is probably just calcula. Would it be negative? No. Oh. Yeah. So would you always put an absolute value in this situation? I'd recommend, well, I'd recommend putting that absolute value on your formula sheet. Because it'll... Cause the reason for that is that friction, well, it's pretty much always negative since it kind of always opposes motion. And the formula doesn't care about that because it's comparing an x to a y. Okay. So the mu k will never be negative, right? No. Okay. Mu so k is just a ratio comparing magnitudes. Okay. You said mu is always between zero and one? Correct. Yeah, so it's point 0.169. I will write that down. Some people are visual learners. Yes? Did you say that the static friction was the 7.7? 
No, the 70.7 is the magnitude of the force of kinetic friction. Mu is the ratio that creates friction. The 70.7 is the friction itself, the actual force that was being exerted to slow it down. So that's, that is the difference between the force of friction itself, this is the actual force that you feel that slows things down, versus mu, which is a ratio that creates That yeah, so or at, at the very least, some piece of math went wrong somewhere. Doesn't mean all your work is trash. So if I asked you a friction question on the test and like mu is the last thing you calculate and it's 1.2, that does not mean you should erase all the work you've done up until that point. Because odds are some of that work is worth 80% of your points just means there's a math error somewhere that you need to find. Never erase something unless you're absolutely certain it's wrong and bad and not helping you. Um, do you account for subjects? No. How do you guys feel? Glad to hear. Uh, we'll go ahead and wind down here for today. Bring any and all questions, well, email me. You're always allowed to do that. But start studying. Continue discussing things on Friday. If you don't bring questions Friday, I'm going to talk about energy in Chapter 5, which we're going to do anyway. This morning. If, it, if the hurricane is Friday, will we beat online? I forgot about that. That's a great question. Yeah. It's supposed to hit on Thursday night. I keep forgetting that's a thing because I don't, I probably have to go outside and I don't see any conversation. That's my object of conversation. Um, I'll email you. I'll just cancel class. So stay tuned for that. Stay safe.